You have to look very closely to notice the border between France and Belgium. What quickly becomes apparent, however, are the differences in cycling culture. There are more cycle paths, there are considerably more cyclists on the road, and almost 50% of the cyclists are women. Well, here on the North Sea coast, the Belgians also speak Dutch and not French. Until Newport, Jovel 4 runs about 3 km inland from the coast. Only after passing a memorial commemorating the Western Front in the First World War do I return to the coast. After a few kilometers, the coastal landscape changes. Unfortunately, not to the better. Everything is geared towards tourism. In some places, a tram and a motorway-like road run right next to the beach. I am glad when I finally reach Ostend and turn inland. I have two reasons for this excursion. Firstly, I want to see bridges and you will of four ignores this city just like Caen and Bayeux. Secondly, you will of four, according to the route description, uses a ferry connection to the Dutch province of Sealand. This means that it follows the North Sea coast to Flissingen and then turns off into the center of Europe towards Breda, Venlo and the Ruhr area. As the cheapest hotel room on Sealand, Booking.com can offer me, costs 200 euros the night, I politely refuse. I'm not a Dutch colony and therefore not used to such forms of exploitation. I start with a sightseeing day in Bruges. The compact old town center is easy to explore on foot and I have a great view from the famous town hall tower, the Belfry. No building is allowed to tower over this 95 meter high tower from the high middle ages. From Bridges, I cycle straight on to the suburbs of Antwerp. I spend the night in Zwindrecht on the west bank of the Skeld. By the way, my only contact with this river. The next morning, I cross under the Skeld using the St. Anna Tunnel. This only serves pedestrians and cyclists. The lifts are out of order that day, but the escalators are running and working well, even though they look a hundred years old. After a short stroll through the center of Antwerp, I set off in the direction of the Dutch border in Breda. The landscape is flat and not particularly interesting, but the cycle paths are excellent. After about 30 kilometers, I cross the border. 
which, in the best European manner, is almost unnoticeable. The cycle paths get even better and after another 20 kilometers I reach the small town of Breda. This is also the northernmost point of the entire Eurovelo 4. From Breda I continue to Tilburg, south of the town, directly on the Eurovelo 4 route, which runs through rural areas where foxes and hares say good night to each other, lies my hotel. It is a converted former Cistercian monastery, of which only the church still serves its original purpose. On my way I have a less than pleasant experience. Apparently, the excellently developed Dutch cycle paths have a very similar corrosive effect as the German motorways. Quite a few cyclists behave like BMW or SUV drivers. In no other European country I have experienced such fast and reckless cycling. However, not the inconsiderate cyclists, but the rim of my rear wheel finishes my journey the following day. As I cycle around Eindhoven, I hear strange grinding noises. As my plan had actually been to get at least as far as the Rheingau on this tour, I try to ignore the noises and just cycle on. This goes on for another 15 minutes. Then I have a solid flat tire on the rear wheel. When I take a closer look at the situation, it immediately becomes clear that any hope of cycling on is an illusion. There is a massive 10 cm long track in the rim of the rear wheel of my Max Cyclist bike. The inner tube is swelling through and torn open by the brake pads. Nothing can be done about it, but I am quite lucky. After pushing the bike for 3 km, I reach Dörne station. There I take the train to Venlo and then onwards to Düsseldorf. I resume my Jovalo 4 tour in September. For the first time ever I use an e-bike. I want to cycle long daily stages, especially in Germany. I am already familiar with many of the cities on the banks of the Rhine and Main. The only places where I am planning to spend an extra day are Schweinfurt and Bayreuth. My journey to Doine in the Netherlands goes without problems and on the very first day I cover almost 130 kilometers with a new Lemo 1. I cycle along typical Dutch cycle paths through typical Dutch landscapes with intensive farming and lots of cows and a strong smell of fertilizer in the air until I reach the border town of Venlo. I cross the actual border in the nature reserve of the Heronger Buschberge and the Vankumer Heide. The cycle path here is well developed and the whole is a pleasure trip for the eyes and the nose. This changes abruptly when I leave the nature reserve and enter the urbanized area of Viersen. The main impulse here is to get away. After our escape from the former GDR, my family lived here for about two years, but I don't remember anything about it. That's probably just as well. Via noise, which executes a similar coziness as Fiersen, I finally reach the banks of the Rhine and Düsseldorf. Eurovelo 4 is not signposted, but the cycle route on the right bank of the Rhine is hard to miss. The affluence of the area is announced by the cars, but also by the bicycles. Since I left Holland, 
this is the first time that I come across the woefully expensive cargo bikes, which, especially among the green clientele, are now almost more of a status symbol than an S-Class Mercedes. Shortly after Düsseldorf, the smart pack of my Lemo 1 surrenders. The battery is flat. I cycle the last 25 km to Hittorf near Leverkusen in analog mode. As compensation, I enjoy a wonderful sunset on the Rhine. Jovelo 4, the central European route, crosses most of Germany by following the river valleys of the Rhine and the Main. Only the last leg, from Bayreuth to the Czech border, runs through the upper Palatinate forest. However, the landscapes of these river valleys differ considerably. Wide alluvial plains, terraced slopes with vineyards, the narrow valley of the Rhine through the mountains. Similar to the Danube cycle route, Jovelo 4 in Germany has a major advantage. The difference in altitude is negligible. Between Düsseldorf and Bayreuth it amounts to just 300 meters and is spread out over 800 kilometers. The Lemo 1, the e-bike from a Chinese startup, is ideal for such routes. Its electric motor, a rear-wheel drive, is neither particularly powerful nor well regulated. But on a reasonably flat route, I can cover almost 100 km with a battery contained in the so-called Smart Pack, which has a capacity of 540 Watt hours. But I only manage 130 km if I cycle the last 30 km without battery. The motor can be disconnected from the rear wheel axle for this purpose. Of course, that doesn't help much. More important is the fact that the e-bike is extremely lightweight at 19 kg. In the Czech Republic, where the terrain is more hillier, it doesn't perform quite as well. From Düsseldorf to Wiesbaden, Juvel 4 runs along the Rhine cycle route. With the Lemo 1, I manage this leg easily with two overnight stays in Remagen and Bachara. On the first day, I can only use the afternoon for cycling. In the morning, I spend most of the time standing under bridges in Cologne trying to sit out the pouring rain. I use the short dry spells to move ahead, but it doesn't really make much difference. Around 2 pm the thick rain clouds clear and I cycle onwards to Bonn. I use the Willy Brandt Street for this. It will stay in my memory. First, I'm accosted, presumably in Arabic or Turkish, by a migrant co-citizen. Of course, I don't get what he's saying, but it's pretty clear that I'm far from welcome on this street. Another sports car driver then shouts in flawless German. There are so many cycle paths, why do you have to use this road? I save my breath for the answer. They are simply German car drivers. As dusk falls, I reach the Remagen Bridge, of which only the two bridge towers remain. Nearby, I check into my hotel, right on the banks of the Rhine. The next morning, light fog is still rolling, but there seems to be a beautiful day ahead. Ideal for the central stretch of the Middle Rhine. As it is also a Saturday, tourists are already crowding the banks. My first destination is Koblenz. 
first I passed several small spruced up villages with a lot of inns. Then a series of bridges and a cable car. And then I am already at the Deutsches Eck. It's difficult to access because of a summer festival. Well, actually I could have done without it. From Koblenz it is another 50 kilometers to Bacharach. Even with an e-bike, this is quite a distance. It's not particularly beautiful over long stretches either. The cycle path on the left bank of the Rhine often runs right next to a busy motorway because of the steep cut valley. Even the views of Marksburg Castle, Katz Castle and the Lorelei cannot cheer me up. I am glad when I finally reach Bacharach. Because of the weekend, the romantic Rhine town is overrun with tourists. But I still manage to find a decent room. The official Eurovelo 4 leads from Bacharach to Bingen and then to Mainz on the left bank of the Rhine. However, I decide to take the ferry to the other bank at Niederheimbach. I then cycle up a fairly steep ascent and take a direct route to the Niederwald Monument. The monumental Germania is now a world heritage site, which doesn't make it any more beautiful. But the view over the vineyards of the Rheingau partly makes up for this. Fittingly, a Dutch brass band plays heroic music at the Niederwald Temple. Fortunately, it's nothing nationalistic, but more along the lines of Star Wars. The film music for A Bridge Too Far is also included. After listening for a while, I cycle down into the Rheingau and follow the cycle path to Wiesbaden. There I have booked a hotel next to the city park. And there I eat tart flambe on the banks of the Rhine in the evening together with a semi-dry Rheingau Riesling. The next morning I cycle along riverside cycle paths but also through industrial zones and a maze of motorways towards the mine at Flörsheim. I switch to the left bank of the mine and end up on a cycle path that runs through ugly industrial and haber areas. Without a transition I find myself in an idyllic spot. The baroque Mönchhof chapel is surrounded by a small cemetery and stands on the edge of Frankfurt airport. Above me the large carbon ejectors descend and ascend every minute, a foretaste of the mine metropolis. There are quite a few ugly cities in Germany, but I personally think that Frankfurt deserves a place of honor. Fortunately, via the mine cycle path, 
I experienced the city from its harmless side. I cycled through almost all of Frankfurt on the left bank of the Main. Nearly the entire route is car-free and there is even some greenery. I can only see Manhattan from a distance and it's just about bearable. As I leave the city in the east, a signpost tells me that I am not only on the main cycle path or the Eurovel 4, but also on the path of the late harvest rider. We have to thank the Episcopal Grape Courier, who was two weeks late, perhaps he had some French blood in his veins, for the discovery of the Spätlese. It contains grapes affected by noble rot. Passing Rumpenheim Castle, a formerly princely country estate where Emperor Franz Joseph and Tsar Alexander III have also stayed, I leave the urbanized area. But it's another 40 kilometers to Aschaffenburg. Before I reach the town, I switch back to the left bank of the Main. I cycle straight into Aschaffenburg via the two main sites. The town's landmark visible from afar, is Johannesburg Castle. The magnificent building dates back to the Renaissance and was the second residence of the Archbishops of Mainz until 1803. Today it houses several museums, including an important painting gallery. The second major attraction is also located directly on the banks of the Main, the Pompeianum, is a replica of a Roman villa. It was modeled on the Casa de Dioscuri in Pompeii. The replica was commissioned by the Bavarian King Ludwig I. As impressive as this residence is, the atmosphere is rather museum-like. Cycling from Aschaffenburg to the capital of the mine, Würzburg, in one day is too much for me, even with the Lemo 1. To cut the long distance in half, I spent the night in Mark Heidenfeld. First I cycle to Miltenberg, on the loop of the Main. The little town is not only on the Roman Limes route, but also in the free state of Bavaria, subregion Lower Franconia. As befits former Roman territory, Wine grows on the terrace slopes here. This year, at least, it gets plenty of sunshine. On the valley slopes, which rise steeply to the Spessart, large quarries are noticeable. That is the red mine sandstone. It is a subformation of red sandstone, which also dominates in the eastern black forest. Already the Romans used it, and it was used as building material for many historical buildings. From here I continue to Wertheim. Halfway there I reach Henneburg Castle. The former Hohenstaufen hilltop castle lies on the right bank of the Main and belonged to the Teutonic Order for a time. Wertheim and its castle, which lies on a steep spur between the Main and Tauber valleys, is no longer part of Bavaria. It is the northernmost Franconian town in Baden-Württemberg and the region is known as Tauberfranken. After spending the night in Markt Heidenfeld, my route continues to Neustadt am Main. The town is dominated by the church towers of a former Benedictine abbey, which vanished during secularization. Around the mine loop, about 35 kilometers further on, I come to Laudenbach, today a district of Karlstadt. 
there is a very old village synagogue from the 17th century. After the November pogrom, it was sold and used as a barn. It is currently being renovated as a memorial. Before I cycle into Würzburg, I pass Sellingen. This small town has a magnificent church designed by Balthasar Neumann. Würzburg has only 130,000 inhabitants, but seems larger and more significant. Unlike Frankfurt, it is a city worth seeing. For me, it is the most beautiful city on the Main. Even Bamberg and Bayreuth come in second place. The city center had been destroyed in the Second World War, but at least the representative buildings and churches have been restored or reconstructed. My hotel is very central and the first thing I do is stroll around the city and send a birthday present from the Burgospital. I used to love Franconian wines, especially the Silvana, but now I prefer Riesling. Towards evening I stroll back to the old mine bridge. I buy a Silvana and toast to Würzburg. Although it is now mid-September, the weather remains midsummery. Not a single drop of rain has fallen since I left Cologne. I set off from Würzburg towards Schweinfurt in glorious weather. As I have never been to Schweinfurt, I plan to visit the museum there. Once around the mine bend and 20 kilometers further on, I reach Kitzingen, where there is also an important bridge over the mine dating back to the high middle ages. The bridge even appears on the town's coat of arms. The next destination is Münster Schwarzbach Abbey, the monastery whose founding history goes back over a thousand years is now an important location for the Benedictine missionaries. However, the monastery church is relatively new. It had been built in 1935 to replace the previous church building. From Münster Schwarzbach I cycle again through areas heavily characterized by viticulture. Extensive terrace slopes alternate with pretty villages. Volkach is particularly worth seeing. It reminds me of the vine-growing villages in the Rems Valley. The vine-growing landscape accompanies me as far as Schweinfurt. The town is nothing special, but I spent the extra day here to visit the Georg Schäfer Museum. It houses the collection of a former Schweinfurt industrialist with a focus on 19th century art and is well worth a visit. Unfortunately, the paintings by Caspar David Friedrich have already been taken down for the special exhibitions in 2024. The last two important destinations on the main cycle route are Bamberg and Bayreuth. As there is no hotel room available in Bamberg, I choose one near Bad Staffelstein. That's a journey of over 100 kilometers, so there is not much time for sightseeing. However, I have already been to Bamberg twice. So I can take some time for Hasford at least, a small town formerly a border fortification between the dioceses of Würzburg and Bamberg, has two churches worth seeing. 
The parish church of St. Kilian has a high altar with wooden figures of the three Franconian pattern signs from the Riemenschneider workshop. Even more interesting is the Knights Chapel Santa Maria, an important late Gothic building in Lower Franconia. It's a good 50 kilometers from Hasford to Bamberg. This is where the wine growing landscape comes to an end and beer reigns. But certainly not for me. In the university town of Bamberg I take an extended stroll through the town. As it's a Saturday, a few thousand people have the same idea. It gets very crowded. Nevertheless, it's a nice city. Sort of a Franconian Tübingen. In the late afternoon I cycle the further 40 kilometers to the Land Hotel Augustin near Bad Staffelstein. At dusk, Fürzehn Heiligen and Banz Abbey loom over the Main Valley. The following day I experience an impressive patronal service in Fürzehn Heiligen. Rarely have I seen such a beautiful play of light even in a Gothic church. From here it's just under 60 kilometers to Bayreuth. I cycle along the mine, which is now quite a trickle. Bayreuth, the youngest university town in Bavaria, has plenty of sites. However, the World Heritage Site is not the, in my eyes, rather rundown festival theatre, but the Baroque Margraville Opera House. For a few years now, a festival with Baroque operas and concerts has also been held there in late summer. The admission prices are on an aristocratic or rather plutocratic level. Unfortunately, I can't visit the theater because of the festival. Instead, in addition to the festival theater, I visit Wagner's former home and take an extended tour of the city. From Bayreuth I set off on the last stage of the Eurovelo 4 through Germany. It is a very beautiful route through the Upper Palatinate forest, mostly on dedicated cycle paths. The first part goes via Weidenberg to Mark Tretwitz, a typical mountainous route but without any difficult or steep climbs. Just the right terrain for the Lemo 1. After just about 60 kilometers, shortly before Mark Tretewitz, my smart pack is finished and I have to switch to analog mode. My destination for the day is Konosreuth and the last 15 kilometers are quite a climb. The highly praised decoupling of the Lemo 1 doesn't help much. The following day I cycle across the border between Waldsassen and Schäb. It's an EU border, you hardly notice it. <laughs> 